Hi guys, welcome, or I'm welcome to be here. Um, my name is Nick, please just call me Nick. And this is a little bit of a deviation from the trauma month that you guys are having, but I think a lot of the concepts in here you can apply to trauma codes, um, and of course they're applicable to medical codes as well. Um, a lot of it is more how you approach, or the mindset that you get into when you approach a code. The medicine we kind of all know, but that also that gets trumped by um, being overwhelmed, at least initially, in the moment when the code comes in. So let's get started. So um, I don't have any disclosures, I'm not affiliated with everything, this is just me digging into some of the data and um, presenting you with some important topics. So take home points right up front. The big thing, the, when a code comes in, I sometimes find myself saying this myself as well, is planning, communication, and leadership, and then I repeat that three times. It kind of gets me in the right mind frame for how to organize the code and get everybody on the same page and get everything done efficiently. Second take home point is focus on good quality chest compressions with a chest compression fraction of greater than 60%. Aim for 80. This is the only thing that has shown uh, significant improvement, survival, mortality, and good neurologic function uh, during a code, both um, for medical codes, as well as some trauma codes, but mostly in medical codes. For tropical rhythms, early defibrillation times. And then I'm gonna argue that ACLS is just BLS with window dressings. Okay, so I went to medical school with Mike, and I'm gonna confess something, my first time meeting you all. We used to watch Jersey Shore. <laughs> like the whole thing, we used to go to parties. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of our favorite shows in medical school. This is how we survived for years in medical school. And I also like to come up with like silly ways to remember things so I don't forget them. So in gym tan laundry, and then pump the fist till you drop. I'm going to replace gym tan laundry with planning communication. <laughs> so just repeat that. So instead of GTL, we repeat CL. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about PDA REST, although I do want to talk about that in the future, because there's a nice little algorithm that came out a couple of years ago that, remembering H's and T's are like a thing of the past. I can barely remember them while I'm sitting down, you know, drinking a cup of coffee, never mind someone's dying in front of me. But I do want to talk about that at some point. Uh, Vasopressin steroids and FE is a controversial topic that we can talk about at another time. And then post rocks care is another three lectures that we can give at another time as well. This is primarily going to be about tropical rhythms, VFIT, VTAC rest um, in a medical um, context. But the mindset that you have to get into when you come in with, a, with a, an unstable patient or a crashing patient comes into your door is something that's applicable across the board. So we get a box call. You're on your first shift, or I'm on my first shift in August. And I get a box call, 62-year-old guy found down, clutched his chest before. He, he collapsed, and this is the initial rhythm for EMS. <laughs> that was my face when I was a medical student, probably up until about a third year, and then it kind of settled away. But this is my initial response when that happened. And then I'm quoting the House of God great book, is first thing you need to do is check your own pulse. So this is where you take a step back, get settled in, and focus on tasks, tasks at hand. And now we're gonna dive into this. Again, this is probably the most important thing uh, from this lecture, and when running a code is taking control of the situation and applying a couple of these concepts. So this is Casalo. He came up, I think this was in 2013, um, this paper of how teamwork um, and the way you run a code actually impacts outcomes. So not only survivability, but achievement of ROS and survival of the hospital discharge. He came up with this framework and core concepts that permeated throughout all the literature. So he did a big lit search and came up with these three concepts as being um, evident and improving outcomes. So planning, leadership, and communication. Actually, actually it should be planning, communication, and leadership, PCL, we're doing the GPL. So first thing was leadership. And this again showed up in about 16 studies, five review articles that codes that were run with great qualities of leadership and they had strong leadership running the code had reduced treatment time, so time that you wanted an intervention, the time it was delivered was decreased, and then you got ROS faster. So the important points of being a good leader is when you walk into the room, I want you to be calm, be assertive, identify yourself as a team leader, and delegate um, tasks efficiently. 
Ideally, you do not want to be doing something. You do not want to be putting in a central line. You do not want to be doing, um, imagining an airway. You want to be at the foot of the bed, take a step back so you can kind of orchestrate everything that's going on. I, affiliate, I uh, equate this to being the maestro of an orchestra. Okay, has anybody been to a symphony or done or seen an orchestra or anything like that? The maestro is running everything. So he's like, and the bass, and the trumpets. And that's kind of what I want or how I think of running a pillow. I'm the maestro, and everybody else around is the symphony, and I'm conducting the symphony, okay, step by step. It's hard to do that when you're managing an airway or you're putting it in a central line. Um, hopefully, if there's enough resources there so that things can get done, or that you can um, troubleshoot a little bit so that it's an easier step than just trying to put in a, a, a triple movement or something like that, or a central line. And then, Leaders should be distributing tasks, like I said earlier, and again, communicating clearly. All of these are intertwined, and we'll get into communicating what constitutes a good communicator in a second, but a leader should be able to designate tasks and communicate clearly about what's going on. And of course, failures, you're gonna see that this evident uh, as a slot of the lecture progresses, but failures and breakdowns in these core concepts had a negative effect, so decreased time to rise, and of course, or CPR performance, which again, CPR is the base, is the foundation of ACLS. <clears throat> so plan, super important. Um, when a code comes in, you get notified of a code, or if you have the luxury of having some time before a code comes in, it's important to start the plan, or at least start it as even if they're running in or it happens in front of you, taking a couple of steps ahead to plan. And again, good, Good markers here. So, if you had effective planning, you had um, reduced hands off time, so better chest compression fraction, faster treatment compared, and then you adhere to the algorithm better. <clears throat> so, the big thing with planning is prioritize. Do life sustaining measures and prioritize them first. It's a shockable rhythm. Plan to get those hands on as quickly as possible, analyze the rhythm, and then deliver a shock as quickly as possible. Prioritization also um, deals with doing getting access, getting access, managing airway if it needs to be managed, um, and then, you know, again, doing high quality chest impressions. And then assigning tasks. So people now are, when there's time to come in, they're literally putting stickers on, or lanyards, or some sort, sort of identification, so that people have assigned roles and they know what their roles are. Um, I think it's a little bit excessive, but I think the, the concept is there where, you need to clearly identify roles for people so that they know what they're doing. And then communication. This is probably the most important thing um, with codes in terms of being an effective leader. You have to communicate appropriately. And the big take home point is it's not that hard. Keep it short, keep it simple, repeat, have closed loop communication, and also ask a ton of questions. Me personally, when I run a code, I'm asking a ton of questions to everybody. Is it, is, are they good? Are they able to be bad easily? When was the last time we gave epi? Are you starting to feel tired on your chest impressions? What does the belly feel like? All those things. Asking someone to get a history from the family. You are the person, you're the maestro, like I said before. You have to know everything that's going on and make sure that everybody in their designated tasks knows to tell you what's going on. It has to be in an organized manner, and that's also part of your role as a, as a leader as well. So that if someone's causing a ruckus or if it's getting loud, don't be afraid, shout out. I need quiet. Anybody that doesn't need to be in the room, get out of the room, okay? Might come off as a little bit blunt, but someone's life is in the balance, and sometimes you have to do that. And again, break down the communication again, increase uh, time to loss. So again, in summary, this is a really important part, and I think um, they're, gonna, they're gonna upload these on the, on the website somewhere so you guys can access them, but this is super important. Um, be decisive, be calm, designate tasks, and communicate. Super duper important. So I'm gonna go on a little bit more of the medicine behind this. The mind frame is important to set up, but once that actually comes in, things you can do to um, optimize your, and your success. So this was um, Paredes and actually Man Mandy Rivers, or a little direct therapy, Mandy Rivers. So he loves putting catheters in people. So he had a case series where people come in and, and arrest, and he put in right atrial catheters and aortic catheters, and measured their pressures. 
Because what's the important thing? What's the important parameter that we're trying to do when we get uh, when we get ROS? What's the, the parameter that we are um, that's most associated with ROS? That's the measurement that we use. Coronary perfusion pressure. So that's the thing that's in links to um, success rate and prognosis in, in uh, ROS. So coronary perfusion pressure. Ideally, you want to get around 20. Coronary perfusion pressure is diastolic pressure minus your right atrial pressure. So that's perfusing the coronaries, trying to get your heart um, back into some sort of, uh, to get oxygen so that you get some back into some organized rhythm. Um, so he basically did this study to look at coronary perfusion pressure. So he inserted catheter in the right atrium, inserted catheter in the aorta, and then as CPR was going on, measured those pressures and determined what the outcomes were, and correlated them to what the outcomes were. And he noticed, this is a while ago, I think this is in the 90s, he, he noticed that people who had ROSC had a higher coronary perfusion pressure. That kind of makes sense. Um, and then to map it out, so these are the people with, um, this is what their initial coronary perfusion pressure were. So it's a little bit higher than people who never got a cheap ROSC. So people with higher, who started out with higher per, uh, coronary perfusion pressures had a better outcome. And then right before, um, this is measured later on what their maximal coronary perfusion pressure was during the code. Um, you can see a higher coronary perfusion pressure if they achieve ROS. So it's a prognostic factor, and it's actually something that we try to theoretically shoot for um, with giving epi, with doing the chest impressions. And then this is another example of showing how your percentage of ROS increases with the increase in your coronary perfusion pressure. Any questions so far? Please interrupt me. Don't feel um, I'm very informal. Please interrupt me and ask a question if you have any questions. <clears throat> okay. So, per the guidelines that we're releasing, 2015 is kind of the standard, though. Uh, rate of 100 to 120 needs to be at least two inches. That's important to get good uh, forward flow. And then this is super important, full chest recoil. It's very tough, especially in the moment you're leaning over the patient. You don't want to go all the way up and you, you don't fully allow that chest to recoil. Well, I'm, a, um, I'm from New York originally. I'm a huge underdog fan. I'm a fan of the Mets, Knicks, Jets, so I've been just a, life, a lifetime of suffering and rooting for the underdogs. But, so just like I'm a fan of the right heart, because that's the underdog, the LD takes the big you know, glory of most things, but the RV is like the, the silent killer that no one thinks about. Same thing with diastole. Systole is what everyone's important, uh, focused on, right? Systole is 1,200 and all that stuff. But diastole is actually important for coronary perfusion pressure, contributes to two-thirds of your nap. And that's how your heart pretty much gets its, its perfusion in diastole. So I'm a big proponent of diastole, so please focus on getting full chest recoil while doing 100 to 120 uh, compressions a minute. And then chest compression fraction is another big thing that, that was focused on in the guidelines where you ideally want to do 60%, but aim for 80%. So all of these small interruptions where you're checking for a pulse or trying to get a tube in or um, trying to get a line in, a central line in, those actually add up and people actually look at this stuff. So Tom Reed, he did a, a study for out-of-hospital out cardiac arrest for patients who had um, CPR for more than five minutes and analyzed and looked at, basically looked at how long people were doing chest, impression, chest impressions for and what their chest impression fraction was and how that impacted survival and ROS. <clears throat> so this is a tough thing. I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna bring you through this here. So basically, this is at five minutes. So if, if uh, CPR is going on at five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, okay? So five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. When chest compression fraction was less than 80, when chest compression fraction was more than 80, and then their outcomes. Initially, really no big statistical difference, okay? Presumably, you could, you could think about that as the coronary perfusion pressure didn't drop as much because they were only in uh, a pulseless rhythm for less than five minutes. Small amounts of chest impressions can bring back the, the, the pressure. So once you get out at 10 minutes and 20 minutes is when you start to see the difference, okay? Increased survival with greater than 80, 
percent chest compression fraction, and then this is greater than 80 as well. There's a p-value that's, that's statistically significant across the board for um, 20 minutes. And then this was another one, basically looking at something very similar. So out of hospital detect fit, um, looking at chest compression fraction, uh, using some software to measure literally how long people are pushing on the chest. And here again, it shows that the higher your, your survival is correlated to the higher chest compression fraction. And here, 60%, that's the goal that everyone's trying to shoot for. You get a, a survivability of about 25%. It jumps up a little bit if you can get to 80. So that's why we shoot for 60, hope for 80. Ideally, 80 is what we're looking for. And how do we do that? We do that by analyzing, by limiting pulse checks, things like that. Um, and again, how do we build up the coronary perfusion pressure? It's through all this stuff. So someone looked at, uh, Peter Berg, uh, Robert Berg looked at pigs, animal models. And he basically compared 15 and two to continuous uh, chest compression and looked at their coronary perfusion pressures and through PA catheters and aortic catheters, what those pressures looked like while we were doing CPR. And you can see here that during the 15 chest compressions, your pressures go up, 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 and then they drop back down when you're doing the two breaths, okay, the rescue breaths. And then they get back up, back, 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 back up, and then they drop off while you're giving the rescue breaths. And indicating that your pressures are increasing while you're doing the compression, and then they drop off once you start giving your rescue breaths. And then this is also indicative where in the top line is the coronary perfusion pressure of the last two compressions of that cycle. And then the bottom is the, the coronary perfusion pressure of the first two breaths of that next cycle. So basically showing, I'm doing my 15 compressions at the end of the cycle, it's that high. I do my two rescue breaths and then this is the pressure when I when I start my next cycle, showing that the coronary perfusion pressure drops off. And this is another diagram indicating something very similar to that. So that continuous chest compression pretty much maintains and sustains that coronary perfusion pressure. So part of the 2015 guideline is, again, highlighting all that targeted uh, uh, chest compression fraction of at least 60%. Minimize your pulse checks, ideally less than 10 seconds, even doing the ultrasound. So I like using the ultrasound during codes, but limit that to like five or 10 seconds. Um, and then we always try to pull back. We're worried about getting shocked even while the, the, the defibrillator is charging. Leave those hands on doing the compressions until it's all the way and you're about to push that button. Then as soon as people say clear, clear, give the shock and then put your hands right back on for the checks. Um, I like using these toys, so I, I try not to put in central lines during codes if I don't have to. Um, I actually would rather get an A-line if possible, and that's to try and target my diastolic, my diastolic um, pressures, so I know what their pressures are. And I can see when someone has an organized rhythm and has big pulse, a nice pulse pressure variation, um, so I don't have to do pulse pressure. Um, and I, of course, someone said patinography. I love an entitled CO2, and you'll see a jump up in their CO2 once they get that rush of, of perfusion back to their heart. Okay, yeah, early, yes? Is that A-line or femoral? Uh, probably be easier femoral. So I usually just do feminine lines. And if I, or the way I do it is I can justify going in the thighs by saying I'm putting a triple movement. And if I hit an artery, I'll just put it in the A-line. <laughs> and if I hit a triple movement, then, then there we go. Um, or I've actually also done it sometimes where I take the, while someone's doing the compressions, I'll actually take the ultrasound and do it there. I've had much more success doing that because you can actually see it. And I'm a huge proponent of ultrasound doing it that way than just doing it blind. So if an ultrasound is available, I'll do that. So you mentioned that you like doing ultrasound during the code. There's been a couple of shops around the country that are starting to um, leave the ultrasound on during compressions for proper um, cardiac compression, so for good cardiac uh, function. I don't know if that's something that... So with TE. So TE is the way that they're trying to do that. Now. That's one of the, the few patient populations that I think TE might be useful if you get a ton of codes coming in your shop. But I don't, I don't know if... We've seen transthoracic. I mean, it looks like garbage. Oh, yeah. You're, so, do, so 
I, I don't. I don't leave the probe on because then the jelly gets on and people are slipping and sliding. What I do is during a, during a pulse check, what I would do is I take the ultrasound probe, put it on, I look, have someone count to ten, and I record the video then. And I'm not looking at it to try and analyze it then. I record the video for 10 seconds. Once they hit the 10, I'm off, and I'll look at it while they're doing compressions. Okay? Codes are actually very simple. It seems like chaos is going on, but it's actually very simple. Um, I'm literally sitting at the at you know at the foot of the bed and I'm I'm checking with the, the nurse, the meds nurse, and I'm like, okay, when was the last time we gave that Okay, and I'm just looking at compressions, I'm looking at the airway. There's not a ton of Things, it's, it's a lot more simple than people get credit for. Initially, though, it's that, it's that mindset that you have to get yourself into. If the goal is to increase coronary perfusion pressure and the right atrial pressure is asserted for that, then is there any argument for giving pressurized saline fluids to the central circulation? To so, so, I, I, so unless it's, so for V-Vib, V-TAC, or hypovolemic shock or something like that, I'm giving fluids. If it's a wide complex tachycardia, and kind of getting in that PEA box that I, I hopefully will talk about at some point, not in this lecture, um, I would give fluid. I would have fluids hanging through the under pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm giving them volume as a doing all this. Yes. We're good. All right. Perfect. Um, can you extrapolate at all from like the Lucas data because that, like, they were trying to use the Lucas as like the you'll never stop having chest compression thing. Their research didn't really pan out. Oh, you're talking about the, uh, the thumpers? Yeah, exactly. So those are useful, but again, they have it takes time to set up, right? And that's the only thing that I really have against them, is that if you can get it on while, while people are doing chest impressions and you can you know work it around them, that's fine. Um, or if you have like long times to a hospital or something like that, I think those are, are totally appropriate, but you have to try and work with them and not Sacrifice chest compression to your chest compression fraction while setting it up. So, this is Empire City. I did have the horseshoe you see now in Baltimore because they just opened one up. But, um, Empire City, and the reason why I have this up is because they actually tested defibrillator times and how those affected um, um, shockable rhythms in casinos. So, it's a highly populated area, people are always there, and a lot of people actually like die. Um, or try to die at the So they basically put AEDs around the casino and, and waited for someone to collapse and slap these babies on and check to see how that improved their survival. And then their primary outcome was survival and discharge. And they basically said that if you gave your shock within three minutes of cardiac arrest, your survival improved by 25%. So highlighting the fact that time of defibrillation is super important. And the guidelines actually say, give your shock as soon as you can. So doing the two cycles and then giving a shock, no more. If you have a shockable rhythm, do CPR until you can get that ready. Do your compressions until it's all charged, and then give your shock. This is another one that basically showed um, to, to analyze um, time of defibrillation. And it basically shows here survivability decreases as the minutes increase. So the more you delay your shock, the more your survival dropped off. And once you get past four minutes here, your p values are amazing. Isn't that with witnessed, though? If you're seeing witnessed arrest. Correct. Right, Correct. but if it's unwitnessed, you still are doing those two minutes of CPR. Correct. Until you can get that defibrillator. Right. Again, not sacrificing chest impressions until you can get that defibrillator hooked up and analyze the rhythm. Alright, and now I'm going to talk about how ACLS and just BLS with window dressings. So how many how how many residents or even faculty in here ever looked at how many times someone is bagging a patient when they're in cardiac arrest? Okay. What what would you just round number, what would you say they're bagging at? Yeah, 20, 30, right? We always say, you know, every six to 10 seconds or something like that, but it always winds up being two to three seconds. And that chaos, it seems like a long time to wait, four or five seconds or six seconds. Um, so this study actually kind of looked at that. 
So our recommended respiratory rate during COVID is around um, 12 to 15. That's what they recommend. But this person saw and counted the average respiratory rate during COVID and found it to be 30, around 30. So we're bagging someone 30. Um, so he applied this to pigs. Now granted it's pigs, it's not humans, but they're pretty similar, um, believe it or not, physiologically. Um, and a lot of this data originally started on pigs. So he took pigs, randomized them to a, a induced VTAC and ran a code on them and randomized their, their uh, ventilation speed to 12, uh, this should be 20, and 30. And then looked at all these different parameters. So this is mean intrathoracic pressure, cerebral, um, coronary perfusion pressure, and uh, right atrial diastolic pressure. And then looked at their, their outcomes. Um, basically showing that at higher ventilatory rates, all of these showed worse, were worse values. So at a higher ventilation, of course, when you're applying positive pressure, you're increasing your thoracic pressure, increasing your afterload, decreasing your venous return, venous sewing, all that stuff, right? All negative stuff. Positive pressure is not the best thing in the world, right? In certain situations. So higher ventilation, poor indices, poor values. This guy um, randomized passive ventilation, so, so oxygen, O's up the nose, versus BVM. Actually showed that the passive oxygenation, again, this is not a respiratory arrest, right? This is not A or DS or anything like that. This is primary and cardiac issue with presumed normal lungs. Passive oxygenation actually did better. Not statistically significant, but actually did a little bit better in these studies with a, with a better odds ratio than BVM. Okay? <clears throat> so again, the guidelines recommend you can, if you're if you're qualified, you can insert in a, 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 a stable airway if you have the skills, but it should not interrupt chest compression. Super important. Okay, we have other ways that we can do that. We can do superglottic airways. We can do just high flow up the nose, things like that. Okay, but BVM or or positive compressions to put in an ET tube that's now starting to get faded away. If you can put an ET tube in during the compression, it's great but it's really tough. If you ever had to do it, it's really tough. You have things going up and down, and it's, it's not good. It's not ideal. Do you believe that the excess of the hyperventilation when you're two is also the same case? Yes, or same thing. Good. Yeah, because it's the same concept, right? You're delivering positive pressure, you're increasing your intrathoracic pressure. And there's a, there are studies that show people without any lung pathologies, underlying lung diseases or damaged lungs, active disease, have a safe acne time, meaning time where you're like technically safe, you don't desat, and you, you're in a safe range for accumulating CO2 of up to eight minutes. So if I, if I gave you rock, and you're presumably healthy, you're breathing fine. If I left you there for up to eight minutes, I could technically get you back and you'd be totally fine. So that's oxygenation, right? But you ventilation, so ventilation too. So again, if you're obese, if you have other underlying diseases, you'll accumulate you're, you're at a, you have less reserve, so you'll fall off the cliff faster, but you can technically ventilate enough. If I keep your airway open, if I just keep your airway open, jaw thrust, okay, pull your mandible forward, and I put enough oxygen and flow into your nose, high flow nasal cannula, or something like that, you'll have enough CO2 exchange with normal lungs to survive, to make you survive, okay? Completely against what we're taught, right? BVM, you put someone up, BVM, BVM, and you, you ventilate them. If you have a normal person, so you or I, or you know, um, a normal parent that has a primary VTAC or S or VFib or S, you don't, without any underlying lung pathology, just keep their airway open, and especially don't jeopardize chest impressions to put in an advanced airway, okay? You can get by by either doing oxygen or a superglottic airway. A lot of people are starting to move more towards superglottic airway. <clears throat> so, who loves using that urinary codes? Everybody has used that urinary codes, right? You guys are big enough. But everybody uses that urinary codes, and they think it's the end all be all, right? Does anybody know what study that was based off of, really? It's this one. Do you know what he used for this data? So, this is random. Dolph? Close. Dolphs. 
So that was the first study that showed epi being um, a better outcome. But it was only in dogs. It was crazy. So he basically induced a bunch of VTAC VFib in dogs and gave them all of these different medications and shot them and showed that epinephrine had better um, ROS than giving them nothing, than giving them just bicarb or nothing. And then all this stuff showed that they got circulation better. So he extrapolated that out, and now we give epi to everybody. They actually did studies showing changes on uh, higher dose epi, right? So if one is, is good, five is better, right? Because it's more. <clears throat> and again, this is all non-traumatic, out of hospital things, a little bit different from what we were talking about again. And looked at endpoints of ROS, survival of discharge, and then neurologic outcome. Really important stuff. Okay? So he basically said that people who got higher doses did better, and those were statistically significant in terms of getting ROS and then surviving to a hospital admission. The important thing is people are, there, there's controversy over, okay, what are your endpoint parameters? Do you want to increase your amount of ROS or does long-term parameters make more sense? So if I can get someone into the ICU but make them neurologically devastated, is that a win for us? Should we be looking at other parameters? And so people are turning towards discharge from the hospital or discharge with your neurologic function. So basically showing that you do get better ROS percentages, you do get better admission percentages, but if you look at these longer out parameters, survival of hospital discharge or CBC, these are um, good neurologic functioning, they're not the same. So again, depending on what you want, what you want to achieve, is epinephrine really helping us? And the, now there's more data coming out now that epinephrine could actually be deleterious. And this is the same thing. So I, I skipped over this study, sorry, but this is basically showing, um, analyzing two different people when they had IV access, when they didn't have IV access. So this is um, with IV access, so they got epi, no IV access. Same thing here. So. Again, long-term outcomes, really not that different, whether they got it or not. So they say, may be reasonable if you do that, okay? All right, this is my take on points. I'm a little over, I apologize, but I am uh, done. These are really important, remember them. Remember PCLA, and uh, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Are you pre-charging?